In the previous two videos, we looked at some of the properties of form momentum. In this video, I want to return to the dilemma that we started this unit with, this question of momentum conservation. So let me say again what momentum conservation is and why it matters, and then we'll look at momentum conservation for this relativistic form momentum. So here's um, some sort of collision. Maybe we have two objects, a big one and a small one, and they're traveling through space and they collide. This is supposed to be a collision. And then maybe this one bounces off this way and this one keeps going that way. And if um, momentum is conserved, which it would be if this is a, an isolated system free of interactions, then this total momentum, this plus this, before the collision should equal this total momentum after the collision. So let me write an equation for that. This idea of conservation, meaning stays the same, is it P1 plus P2 has to equal P3 plus P4. Again, you can think of this as some sort of accounting principle. There's some sort of interaction here, and it could change individual velocities, um, directions, definitely would, but the total momentum before has to equal the total momentum after. And that's a bedrock law of classical physics. Um, it follows directly from Newton's second law of motion, and for non-relativistic situations where particles aren't moving close to the speed of light, um, it's been verified experimentally again and again and again and again. And so this is something that we would want to um, um, ha also have be the case in special relativity. So we constructed, so and like that was a dilemma. We said, all right, momentum has to be fixed because it's not conserved under special relativity. Um, it's not, right, if this is true in one, if we use classical momentum, if this is true in one reference frame, it's not true in another reference frame. And that's a big problem. Um, so let me just write this condition in a slightly different way. Um, that'll just make the algebra a little easier. So I'll do that down here. So this is equivalent to saying P1 plus P2 minus P3 minus P4 equals zero. So these equations are the same mathematically. That's a really bad P, sorry, I'm a little tired. Um, but this is going to be a little bit easier to work with. And let me, let me write a little bit more. Um, so these vector equations are really multiple equations in one. So this vector, P1, there'd be a t, x, y, and z part. Same thing for 2, 3, and 4. To keep things simple, I'm just going to work with um, t and x. So we're going to assume that... Um, there's a time component and then um, a, a space component in the x direction, but not um, we don't have any motion or change of motion in the y or z direction. So um, a vector equation like this is really four, or in a simplified case, two equations in one. In other words, um, what this means is p1t plus p2t minus p3 t minus p4 t equals zero. So the time parts of momentum, whatever that means, we'll get to that soon, I promise, equals zero. And then the spatial parts, the x parts, they also combine in this way. Okay, so now we're ready for um, the main derivation that I want to do in this video. So um, hang on to this, and let me write up here sort of what we're going to do. So let's suppose that this is true in one frame, so that may maybe you know, we're in the rest frame, and we watch this thing happen, and we say, aha, momentum is conserved. So we're going to say, um, we're going to assume that P1 
P1 plus P2 minus P3 minus P4 equals zero in the at rest frame. So we have momentum conserved in one frame. Would another observer, if Beowulf zips by at some fraction of the speed of light, and he's going to measure different velocities. We've seen that. Because velocity is also frame dependent, for sure. Um, but would he agree that this law of physics is true? So, if, so given this, is it the case that a moving observer also sees this as true? So the observer would have different values for the momentums, but would they would they still sum up to zero in this way? All right. So um, so what I'm going to do is just focus on the x part of this. And um, so I, I'm going to right. So this has an x part and a t part. That's what I was just saying here. I'm just going to work through this for the for the x part of this. And then the T part um, is similar. We won't have to work through that. Okay. So, oh, and sorry, these all should be vectors. But now let's deal with just the X part. Okay, so here's a whole bunch of momenta in the primed frame. So what I want to do is translate these values back into the unprimed frame. And as luck would have it, we just figured out how to do that. Right? We have this relationship here. This tells us if I've got Px in a moving frame, I can relate it to the values of p in um, the at rest frame, px and pt. So x and t get mixed up. This is, again, this is just a Lorentz transformation for momentum instead of um, x and y. But again, um, as we've seen, x and t get mixed up. Something that's purely t in one frame is not purely t in another frame, and so on. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use this formula on this term, this term, this term and this term. And I guess I should say this is still a question, and we're not sure if that's going to be true. So let me work on this side, right? So the first thing I would do is I'm going to have gamma minus beta uh, P1 T plus P1x. So I just replaced this with that using that. So let me write out similar things for the next couple terms. So here's a result of using this formula four times for this, 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 and this. It's this big long expression of pts and px's, one, two, three, four, gammas and betas. So we've got a lot of terms, but I'm going to group them in a particular way. Notice that the, the gamma distributes, so every term has a gamma, um, but sometimes that gamma comes along with a beta. So there's going to be some gamma terms and then some gamma beta terms. So um, let's um, do a big factor here. So we're going to have a, some gamma beta terms. And we're going to have some plain um, gamma terms. So here we go. Gamma beta with a minus P1t. Actually, let me, um, sort of an aesthetic choice. Let me put a minus sign here. So there's a minus gamma beta and a P1t. Where does this term go? Well, that just has a gamma on it. So I'm going to put that down here. P1x. All right. Here I've got a minus gamma beta, minus gamma beta. So this term goes here, plus P1 
P2T. This term just has a gamma and it's a plus. Plus P2X. All right, here I've got two minuses, minus, minus. So there's a minus gamma beta and then another minus with the P3T. Here's um, a gamma, but it has a minus with it. Almost there. Here's a gamma beta, minus, minus. One of those minuses is here. The other one is right there. And then this is going to be a minus P4. All right, so it's math to go from here to here, no physics. And all I did was I factored. Um, so there are eight terms in here, there are eight terms here. You can go backwards from here to here, forwards from here to here. Okay, so I claim that um, this is exciting. And um, it's exciting for physics, it's exciting also because this is basically the end of the derivation, because here's why. Check out what we have here. These are the T components of momentum in the unprimed frame, and they're in exactly this form, right? It's exactly that. P1, P2, minus P3, minus P4, all Ts, and that's equal to zero. Why? Because we're making the assumption that momentum is conserved in this frame. So, mm, 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 that whole thing is zero. Minus gamma beta times zero. And check this out. One, two, minus three, minus four. That's exactly this here, and that's zero. So the whole thing is zero. All right. So that deserves at least a couple exclamation points. So what have we shown? All right. So let me take a couple steps back. We constructed form momentum in this way. Um, based on uh, special relativity, uniting space and time, and then using the proper time for the time interval for the um, four-dimensional speed. And then we said, all right, this transforms like, the, uh, like X and T do, according to the Lorentz transformations. Then we use this to say, all right, well, this thing we built, we're spent all this time building this, is this, does this solve our conservation momentum problem? And the answer is yes. Why? Because we've just shown that if momentum is conserved in one frame, it's conserved in all frames. So momentum, conservation of momentum, is now a law of physics that's the same in all inertial reference frames, which is what the principle of relativity requires. And, um, all, right, all this theorizing is great. I, um, it, it's lovely, it fits together really nicely. The bottom line for science, of course, is experiment. And conservation of momentum, relativistic momentum, has been tested um, again and again and again and again in particle, uh, particle accelerators, where things like this happen at fractions of the speed of light. And every single time, form momentum has been conserved. So um, the conservation of form momentum is taken as now one of the absolute um, foundations of modern physics.